Well, good morning. Winter's on the way. We all got a, got a kick of it last night, I think. And i uh, tell you, it was, uh, I'm glad I didn't have to come in a covered wagon this morning uh, from Columbia because it was right into the wind. I usually get real good gas mileage in my car, but I didn't get any this morning. So tough, tough day. But uh, it's good to be here in this warm place with you folk, and uh, I'm grateful for it. I want to give, I uh, just want to add to what Dave had said a little earlier with regard to uh, the historical retreat, the weekend, uh, the first weekend in December, Friday night, starting at 7 o'clock uh, to about 10 o'clock, and then uh, all day Saturday at the Westin, is that correct? Is that where they're holding it? I think, if not, details will be out for sure. Uh, to let you know that I'm unfamiliar with the hotels, but I know it'll be in a in a hotel uh, conference area that will be holding that. And people who have come, and again, I, I, there have been I know several that uh, know folk from uh, Faith Baptist. There are perhaps others that uh, know from other churches that I've had a chance to work in. Just how significant this weekend is. You might not think that. Uh, walking through the history of a church would be all that interesting, uh, that you could find things that are a lot more significant that you could do with your time. But the people who uh, come and learn how to listen to Jesus, talk to them about their history, uh, there's nothing quite like it. And there are a lot of implications to it, too, that you begin to see that uh, one of the ways that God works that perhaps you have not realized before and just how he can uh, work in different areas of both your life, your ministry, if you've got one, and in the church as a whole, uh, as a pattern, uh, ways that you can connect with Christ and get his input on what's going on uh, on a regular basis. So uh, we encourage you to come, and uh, it, I think there are retreat preparation notes. If you have not had a chance to, to get hold of them, please do. Uh, what we do is we just tell stories, and then just listen to what Jesus has to say about what those the implications of those stories and what he has to say. And again, just teaching people how to use their spiritual gifts to do that kind of thing. It's, it's extraordinary, it really is. And uh, I encourage you to come and give input into it and be praying for it. Uh, just bathe it in prayer. Just, uh, and I'll give the Holy Spirit, one of the things I like to do is encourage people to, to just give the Holy Spirit the freedom to prompt them to pray uh, through the week. And just at whatever point it comes to mind, the Holy Spirit brings it to mind, you pray. And I think we will see God do great things. Great thing for a church to do before a new pastor comes. Just a fabulous thing to get themselves kind of right before God and uh, be able to appropriately welcome uh, the servant that God has uh, for you. So at this Thanksgiving weekend, I want to turn you to a passage that, again, a little unusual for Thanksgiving, but of all the passages I think there are in the scripture, this is one of the most graphic and powerful reasons for us to be thankful. And so I'll ask you to turn to Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3. I do take you to interesting places in the scripture, don't I? Uh, you know, not the, the places you always get uh, to, to turn to, but this is uh, one of those that is almost breathtaking in its nature. We'll pray here in just a second. Let me start with a story. Uh, we had a dog, uh, my family, when I was growing up, and this, this was a mutt. It was part corgi and part terrier and part beef, kind of a little dog. Uh, and this dog had a thing about all moving objects. It would chase them. And it had been hit by a couple cars, so it, this dog walked with a limp. We love this dog, but it got annoying at times. And one time we were out camping in the Shenandoah Valley. My family liked camp as kind of recreation. And we were out camping, and uh, it had gotten dark. The sun had gone down, and all of a sudden, our little dog, who was sitting there with us, this is before everybody had a leash. Uh, the dogs kind of tended to run free, and so our dog was unleashed. And all of a sudden, phew, off it ran into the woods, barking as it went. Well, about five seconds later, we heard a yelp. And then about 20 seconds later, 
this dog came back into our camp with the most pathetic look on its face. And I mean, it's where the definition of hang dog came from. This dog had a hang dog look on its face, and as it approached, we very quickly ascertained why. It had run into a polecat, or a skunk for those the uninitiated among us, and had gotten fully sprayed by this polecat. Well, this dog was used to sleeping in our tent. Not that night, no. In fact, there wasn't a place that we could find to tie it that we weren't still getting wafts of the skunk. And this was in the day before a lot of our cars had air conditioning. That's how old I am. Uh, and this dog went with us when we drove and certainly had to drive back to D.C. To, to home. And so we, this is the days before internet. If you can imagine how lost we were, how do, on earth do we clean this dog uh, and get it fit enough to ride in the car with us? And we heard all sorts of possibilities. Everybody had advice around the camp area. Uh, bathe it in tomato juice. Well, you know, a Bloody Mary dog. I mean, it just... <laughs> Not exactly, and let me tell you, it doesn't work. Uh, we tried it. We tried everything to try and get the smell off this dog. But with this experience, this dog became unfit for human habitation. It really did. So only time wore that stink off of that dog. And it was a long time. Every time it got damp, Outside, you could still smell that skunk. I think that idea of being unfit, that carrying something on your person, we've all probably been invited to places where we walked in and all of a sudden we found out that whatever the dress code was, nobody informed us and we are not dressed the right way. Uh, we don't, and, and, and all of a sudden it's like you're unfit. Everybody else is, is a certain way and, and you don't fit. And the implications of that can be extremely awkward and off-putting and, you know, where you just feel totally out of place. It's not the place for you. It's a common human experience. Well, this portion of scripture is really about being unfit and how God makes the unfit fit. Before we look at it, though, let's turn our attention once more to him in prayer and just ask him to speak to our hearts today and prepare them for the Thanksgiving season that we're entering. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we just thank you for all that you do for us. And Lord, we're going to see a magnificent uh, illustration of that today, but... As we have gathered in your name this morning, uh, would you just draw near to us and speak to us? Uh, let your servants know that you understand what's going on in their lives and where we may not know what to do about that, you do. Uh, forgive us for all the many times we've tried to clean ourselves up. And Lord, just thank you for the provision, the vast and wondrous provision that you have made for our cleansing. Do that for us today. Let us, our hearts leave this place with a deeper and more powerful appreciation of the work of our God on our behalf. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the prophet Zechariah is an amazing uh, individual. He came on the scene at a time in Israel's history. Uh, I, you know, as we've been in the Minor Prophets a couple times, I did a long study, personal study in my quiet time through the Minor Prophets, and I just fell in love with these men. Uh, they have unique messages, and Zechariah is unique among the unique messages. Uh, he 
is a post-exilic prophet, those of you who like to know this kind of stuff. What does that mean? Well, there are three main periods of Israel's history. Uh, there is the pre-exilic, before they went into exile. There is the exilic period, when they were in exile. And then there's the post-exilic, or the guys that came after they came out of exile and back to the land. And Zechariah is one of those post-exilic guys. The nature of this, though, is, is we kind of have to wrap our minds around it because they came back to a land that had been desolate for 70 years. There had just been a few people scattered around, but all the cities had been wasted, uh, leveled just about. It looked like an atomic bomb had gone off in the place using duck and cover last week as a, kind of an illustration. It had just all been wrecked. It was a wrecked country. And this group of about 50,000 people came out of Babylon, back around the Fertile Crescent, back into Israel. And they had no government. They had no police force. They had no economy. They had, we can just go down the list of deficits. Their temple had been torn down and they had no wall of protection around their city. So if there is a definition of vulnerable, there's a definition of kind of people who have no defenses, no protection against people, uh, other countries that might have designs on them, and they existed, they were out there, that hated the Jews, still out there, as a matter of fact, that hated the Jews, that had nothing but, uh, uh, you know, designs for evil on them. That was the post-exilic nation of Israel. And God sent prophets to them, and particularly sent Zechariah, with a unique message. Zechariah's message overall is that though you feel like you have no protection, I am protecting you. So Zechariah sees angelic guards, really, that are out patrolling the land, doing what the military used to do, uh, doing what a police force would, would do, out roaming the land and guarding the people who were there. So though the Israelites could not see these beings that God had sent to protect them, they were there, and Zechariah was given the vision of them and communicated that to the people. I define Zechariah's message that way, that it is a message for people who think they are defenseless to understand how God protects them. And we see that protection from unseen dangers, particularly in chapter 3. Chapter 3 has... Zechariah transported to the throne room of God where he sees something taking place. We read that in verses 1 and 2. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest. Joshua was this is the, the guy back in uh, Moses' time. This is a high priest by the name of Joshua. He showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this, and I think the angel of the Lord points at Joshua, is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Here we have the high priest, the guy that is at the top of the pyramid religiously, the man who had the responsibility of performing the sacrifice at Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, where he would offer the sacrifice for the whole nation. And it is the role of the high priest that Jesus, when he ultimately goes to heaven, steps into. So this is kind of the, the precursor of that, the man who was in the role that ran the religious uh, uh, ministry of the nation of Israel. But again, 
in this post-exilic time, a lot of that is gone. Nebuchadnezzar had torn down the temple, taken all of its valuables back to Babylon with him. There was nothing there. And the book of Haggai that we're going to look at in a couple weeks uh, is the message to the people about rebuilding that temple, getting it started. But Zechariah sees the ministry of the high priest here, and he's standing before the angel of the Lord, kind of in his ministry position, we would think. And there's Satan. Again, we have... I find that Christians often have kind of messed up ideas about Satan and what he's up to and where he is and, you know, kind of king of hell and red pajamas and tail and horns and all that kind of stuff. Not, not the biblical picture uh, that we get of him, much more a Hollywood image uh, than it is a biblical image. Satan is the prince of the power of the air, is the biblical term for him. He is... The one that John put it real clearly that he holds the whole world in his hand. We used to sing that song. Remember that folk song? You got the whole world in his hands. Biblically, the one who's got the world in his hands is the devil. And people wonder why the world is in the shape that it's in. It's because of who the God of this world is. So Satan has rights because he is the prince of this planet to have access into God's presence. And one of the things, we are, we are strangers and pilgrims moving through a strange land here. And boy, I tell you, it's feeling stranger and stranger all the time, isn't it? Uh, we are strangers moving through this land, ultimately headed home, but this isn't home. And the reality is, is that Satan right now has the freedom to stand before God and when his children mess up, to stand before God, point the finger, and accuse them of what they've done. So here, Zechariah gets a vision of the throne room of God. Joshua, the high priest, the guy that's at the top of the religious pyramid for Israel, he's standing there, and Satan has got his finger out and is accusing Joshua of things. We're not told what he's accusing him of. But what we do hear is what the angel of the Lord says in Joshua's defense. And there are a lot of commentators that relate the angel of the Lord to the ministry and person of Jesus, uh, his pre-incarnate state before he became a man that this is Jesus, it very well could be. I'm not sure one way or the other, but either way, he's obviously speaking for God here. And he rebukes the devil, and he says, the Lord who has chosen rebu uh, Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now that's a very interesting image that this was not a brand metal brand that you brand cows with. This is a, a, another way of putting this. This is a stick taken out of the fire. So here is Joshua. Joshua is a stick in the fire until he is pulled out. And that's the way the angel of the Lord describes him. This is combustible material in a fire until God pulls him out. And that's the way I think all of us should view ourselves. We are combustible material, spiritually speaking. And unless God pulls us out, we are in trouble. Now, just how much trouble was Joshua in? We get, a, get that in verse 3. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. Filthy garments. That, I mean, we have an image of a guy that may be muddy. That's not what this word filthy means. This word filthy is the word that was used for the contents of the intestines. This guy is covered 
with excrement. And he is standing before the angel of the Lord. This is like my dog covered with skunk stink. And that condition is unfit for anybody to be around, but much less standing before the angel of the Lord. Can you imagine? Covered. Covered with stink. I mean, we probably all had the experience of stepping into a car and somebody uh, not realizing that they had hit a dog pile on the way to the car. And, you know, you don't have to close the doors of the car for more than a second before somebody, check your shoes, somebody stepped in something. Or you sit down to dinner and you've just come in from outside and the same thing, it's like, all right, somebody's, somebody stepped in something. And it's like, just, just stepping in it makes you unfit for other humans to be around. This guy is covered, covered with it. You've heard me say this before, that we tend to think of ourselves a lot better than we actually are in God's sight. We think, you know, you all are sinners, but I'm, I'm just misunderstood. You know, that's the way we tend to view it. We're not as bad as, you know, others, yeah, but not us. The reality is, is that I believe that Zechariah has this image because, again, this is the guy at the top of the pyramid. This is, I think, and I believe me, I relate to this a lot. As a pastor, I often felt how totally inadequate, how unprepared, how inappropriate it was for me to stand in front of God's people and tell them anything. I had so many issues in my own life, and I've come to understand as a seminary professor, now, that's true for everybody. You will not call a pastor that does not have this experience on a regular basis, standing before God and being totally inappropriately, having to now function as a spiritual leader and realize that things have happened in my heart, in my mind, in my motives that make me unfit for ministry. Unfit. Now, what often happens is that we try to clean ourselves up. We try to clean ourselves up. We turn over new leaves. We try to redo things or reorient things. We try to make things right the best we can with our inadequate approaches. We will try and keep the commandments better. You know, maybe we've been struggling with lying, but maybe we're going to work harder at it. And, and the reality is, is that none of that makes any difference. I remember there was a guy... I used to work for a moving company, did that, worked my way through college and worked my way through seminary working for a moving company. Uh, and this was in Dallas, Texas. In the summer, it was hot. It was really hot. And we had a guy that drove a truck. Uh, we called him Cowboy. Uh, I don't know what his real name really was. We just called him Cowboy. Cowboy was the kind of guy who, you know, working for a moving company, showered once a week whether he needed it or not. And because he realized that he would get a little ripe, he would splash himself with Brute. Remember Brute? He used to splash himself with Brute. And as somebody who would ride in the cab of that moving truck with Cowboy, later in the week, it was, I mean, Fort Dietrich had nothing on Brute and B.O. from Cowboy. 
I mean, if you talk about a toxic mixture, and so you climbed into a cab with cowboy, you were, I mean, again, this is before air conditioning, you were rolling down the windows trying to get some fresh air because this guy stunk. That's what happens when we try, try to clean ourselves up. It's, it's brute on BO. It, it doesn't work. But, behold, how God makes unfit people fit. Verse 4, and he spoke, this is the angel of the Lord, and he spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, remove the filthy garments from him. Again, he said to him, see, and now here's where we read the significance of those filthy garments, what they represent. And this is something that goes, is consistent throughout all scripture. I have taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festal robes. You see, in God's sight, we wear our iniquity. It covers us. And it does not cover us in clean clothes. It covers us in filthy, stinking, reeking garments. And we stand before God's presence with that stuff on us. But God looks at us and says, I will take your iniquity away from you. And doesn't just take it away and leave us standing there with nothing. He then gives us festal robes, the pretty stuff, the good stuff, festal robes. And then Zechariah gets in on it. He says, then I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing by. Now, all of that takes place for a reason. We all celebrate, rightly we should, the cleansing of our iniquity that God provides us. The taking off of these rotten, smelly clothes and the cleansing and the putting on of festal garments, robes of righteousness that we did not earn, could not earn, cannot buy. God supplies. He gives it to us. And we are clothed in it. But it is not just to be clothed with it. Verse 6, And the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and if you will perform my service, then you also will govern my house, and also have charge of my courts, and I will grant you free access among these who are standing here. He not only cleans us up and makes us fit, it is fit, listen carefully, we all need to hear this, and age does not disqualify us here. We have never gotten too old that this isn't true. He cleans us up to do something. It's not just to be something. It is to do something. And a lot of times we come and we experience the cleansing that God provides for our filthy souls and we just walk out and say thank you very much. That's not why God cleans us up. He cleans us up to use us. And it's only clean that we can be instruments that are useful to him. He is making us fit. We were unfit. He's making us fit to do something. And when we do it, he expands the responsibility. If you do this, if you walk in my ways, if you perform my service, then I'll enlarge your service. I'll let you govern my house and have charge of my courts. You can have free access among all those who are standing here. In other words, the experience of taking what God has provided in our cleansing and starting to do something with it expands the horizons 
of what God can do with us. Now, all of us are different. The channel that God carves out for us and the ministry that he wants for us, it may be in our workplace, it may be in our home, it may be somewhere else, it may be in church. The reality is there's some place. So if we've been sitting and accepting kind of what happens on church, getting right with God, kind of our one hour of the week, and then leaving here and doing what we want, we miss the point of why God makes the unfit fit. Why he takes that, those filthy, stinking, reeking garments off of us. So I don't know what he's calling you to do. But I do know that this morning, if you came in and you were covered with stuff that has happened this week, with things you have thought this week, with motives that have driven you this week, with ways you have behaved this week, that render you in your mind and in your heart unfit. God could not use me. He could never use me. This passage gives us a reason for thanksgiving. He will clean us up. But it's not just to be clean. It's to be useful. Now, you may not know what you're supposed to do. Just ask. I believe God will show you. He will show you exactly what at your age level, at your knowledge level, at your experience level, at whatever level you are at, he will open a door because that's what God does. He's just looking for people who are clean and who are ready to be useful to him. So, one of the most powerful passages, I think, in the Old Testament as a basis for human thanksgiving, what God does to clean filthy people up and make them able to be used, useful, fit for him. Amen? So, as we gather around this last kind of song that we're going to sing. If you need to kind of come and rededicate yourself, say, Lord, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but I know I've been cleansed and I just want to ask you for that, feel free to come forward. You don't have to come forward, but if you need to, if you feel like that's important to you, I'll be up here, Dave will be up here, and we'll be more than happy to talk to you about that, pray with you about that. But don't just say, thanks for the cleansing, Lord. See you next week. Not a good idea. Let's bow together for prayer. Oh, Lord, forgive us for the times we have taken advantage of what you've provided and not realized why you've provided it. Lord, uh, you know where we are in our journeys. You know the things that have been going on in our lives. You know the stuff that we've gotten involved in. You know where you fall on our priority list. But we pray that as we understand the, the great sacrifice you've made for our cleansing, and the robes of righteousness that you can clothe, clothe us with, even today. Lord, make us useful for your kingdom. Show us what you want us to do. And may we serve you with full and open hearts. May you make it an adventure for all of us, not a burden, but something that we get to see extraordinary things as well as experience access into your presence. Do this, Lord. Be blessed today by the response of your people to your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.